Hello and welcome to the first of three new SHP online safety talks, all with a Buddhist theme, underpinning them actually. Um, Andrew Hopkins, of course, uh, the mindful safety concept, incredibly powerful and a far-reaching piece that he's, he's talked about, that organisations need to appreciate that there are always problems. The best organisations go out and proactively find what those problems are. The weaker organisations wait for the problems to find them. Similarly, James Reason has come up with his overstretched elastic band model, which says that all organisations will drift towards risk and the best organisations are distinguished by the ability to spot that we've drifted and to snap back quickly. Perhaps a more robust version of that would be Mike Tyson's quip that everybody has a great plan up until he punches them in the face. And, and really this, this overview of the, the holistic well-being piece takes a, a practical view with that and we'll use a, a boxing analogy, a, a boxing case study. Taking a holistic overview of, of a well-being uh, approach, uh, and, and it needs to be a holistic and interconnected approach. Um, you, you can't just have a gym that you can use on a Friday afternoon. Five things really become important. Firstly, to have enough money. Secondly, to spend enough time with family and friends and get that work-life balance right. Thirdly, to have a job that you enjoy. Uh, fourthly, to have your physical health. And fifthly, to give something to society. With money, what you find is you just need enough. We spend an awful lot of our time trying to earn money that we don't need, to buy things that we don't want, to impress people that we don't even like. With family and friends, the finding is always the same, that everybody basically dies wishing they'd spent more time with their family and friends and less time in the office. And it's getting that balance right that, that's tricky. Third issue is um, having a job that you enjoy. You know if you have a job that you enjoy, and that actually adds to your well-being rather than not working at all. And you know if you enjoy it, if your day passes quickly. If it passes slowly, you're in the wrong job. If it passes quickly, you're getting an enrichment in life from that. Family and friends is simply all about sleeping well, exercising a lot, eating well, and a lot of studies show meditating on a daily basis as well. Obviously, that's an awful lot of ground to cover, and there are lots of details that we've skipped straight over, of course. But what I want to do is to use a very famous case study that really illustrates a, a lot of those basic principles. And I want to talk about perhaps the three most famous boxers in history, or the most famous uh, trio of boxers, uh, Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier and George Foreman. Now obviously to start with the, the famous man himself, the greatest, Muhammad Ali, um, perhaps the most famous sportsman of all time, but he's had a horrible time. Uh, already by the 1996 Olympics at Atlanta, he was really struggling physically and the last few decades have been awful for him. He just went on too long. The, the lure of the lights and, and the fame had him fight far more often than he should have done. He didn't quit when he could have done. Joe Frazier was an incredibly well-respected boxer and human being. Everybody liked him for his integrity and his, his skill. Um, but unfortunately, Ali's taunts got to him. Those jokes about gorillas and, and Uncle Tom's and so on. And he actually became extremely embittered. So, for example, towards the end, he had an answer phone message that said, sting like a butterfly, float like a bee. Not anymore. I did that. Pretty pretty dark place to have got to and are not necessarily unrelated to the fact that he died penniless and alone living above a gym. The interesting character of the three is George Foreman, I think, because he suffers the worst sporting defeat in history. He's this unbeatable, terrifying ogre, age 24, fights Ali in the, the rumble in the jungle, expected to win, expected to possibly even hurt Ali, and loses. Uh, gets knocked out in the eighth round, the most famous defeat in the history of sport, utterly traumatic for him. After this defeat, George Foreman disappears off into the wilderness. As it happens, he finds God and a sense of purpose through that, but it could be humanism or Buddhism or, or, or anything, really. But he finds a sense of purpose. And uh, to raise money for his church, what he does is he starts fighting again. And in his career, he starts fighting nobodies, and he's winning, um, but he's very, very cautious. Uh, in fact, he actually got sacked by one of his trainers for refusing to fight somebody who was quite young and, and, and good. I'm not fighting him, he's far too good. So, but he, he keeps winning and he keeps winning and eventually he ends up with a uh, marquee fight against a proper world champion, Evander Holyfield. And obviously he loses, of course he loses, but he does ever so well. And it isn't the joke that a lot of people thought it would be. So a couple of weeks later, a couple of months later, Holyfield has an off night and loses to a young guy called Michael Mora. And Foreman's watching this and he says, well, I can beat him, you know, probably can, but there's a small chance because this kid is young and he's inexperienced. And if I can stay with him until the end of the fight, he'll get tired and he might make a rookie mistake and I'll hit him. 
So that's exactly what happens. He's miles behind on points. They get into the 10th round, but Moore is tired and he pretty much stands still in front of Foreman and he hits him and that's it. He's world champion again at the age of 46. 22 years after he lost his title to Ali in the, in the Rumble in the Jungle. By this time, he's a really nice guy. He's fighting for a purpose. Everybody loves him. He gets offered a contract to endorse a grill machine that you might be familiar with. Um, that sells in its millions. When he cashes in his chips, he just gets uh, $200 million for that or something like that. And he ends up, as he is now, he's happy, he's healthy, um, he's enjoying life, he's rich. You know, he's, he's the perfect uncle that everybody would want. So the question is really, um, who won of those three famous boxers? Even who actually won? And the answer to the question is, why did he win in the long term? And how did he win in the long term? I think have lessons for all of us.